Thank you. You're welcome. Nan and I are delighted to be here today to talk to you about a project that we got involved in about a year and a half ago, maybe even two. No, a year ago. March. Year? Only a year? I, well, I know because it was a tumultuous month. Okay, there you go. Well, time flies. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of goals, and one is that you'll be able to understand what the National Diabetes Prevention Program is and hopefully be able to have a, a little bit of a discussion around, do you have it in your site already? Is it something that you potentially could offer to your folks um, or that you could yourself do? Uh, as well to give you some access to the resources of the Diabetes Prevention Program. The National Diabetes Prevention Program started as a result of a, a study that was through the National Institutes of Health. What they did is they actually enrolled people that were at risk for diabetes with the diagnosis of prediabetes by blood glucose of somewhere between 100 and 125 milligrams. Diabetes is diagnosed when your blood sugar is greater than or equal to 126 fasting on two separate occasions. So in order to be enrolled into the program, you had to have this pre-established risk. Um, there were three arms of the study. One was lifestyle intervention, and we'll talk about that in further detail when Nan gets up. Um, the other was usual care and metformin. For those of you that aren't familiar with the drug, metformin is a pill that is given to people to help with insulin resistance. It helps the body not to produce glucose while you're sleeping so that you wake up with a nice fasting blood sugar. And then usual care with another drug called a thiazolidine dione. I can remember when that drug first came out. It took me forever to figure out how to say it. It's shortened as a TZD. But lo and behold, during the protocol of the study, it actually came out that it was causing people to die. And so they withdrew it from the study and ended that arm. So, you know, as one thinks about people being so gracious to volunteer for these uh, programs of research, uh, sometimes there is a little bit of risk. The program had two specific goals. They wanted to have weight loss through healthy eating. And the intent was to have people lose somewhere between 5 to 7% of their body weight and to encourage people to get regular physical activity with the goal of at least 150 minutes a day. And, and thinking about, um, I'm sorry, a week. <laughs> As the study protocol went on, lo and behold, what they realized was, guess what? Healthy eating and physical activity improves people's risk. And so they actually had to stop the study early. And so it ended, instead of it being, the, for the length that it was, it actually ended at seven years instead of the um, extended period. So isn't that wonderful news? Yeah, we had some people that we harmed because they were on TZDs. Nobody died in that study, by the way. It's just that it was other people doing the medication studies elsewhere. But this slide shows um, from years of randomization, if we started at years at zero, and uh, if we followed through, the placebo were 1,082 patients. Metformin, again, was that drug that causes the blood sugar to be lower in the morning, was about equal in terms of the number. And it was um, a statistically, in comparison to the placebo, at 0 .001. And then the lifestyle intervention, still the same, about the same number of people in three arms. So it was a very valid study, if you think about it. It was three different arms of uh, the study, and they were seriously focusing on getting folks to drop that weight. And so the risk reduction was shown by the yellow line that 31% of the people that enrolled into the program um, had the risk reduction of development of, uh, development of diabetes. And for the lifestyle arm, it was 58% of the people. So everybody was so excited about this. This came out in 2002, and here we are in 2013, and we're still trying to figure out how do we get these people access to this program. And so um, the Center for Disease Control actually decided over the last few years how is it possible that we can bring this to the wider audience? We've done a great job in research, but we also know that getting it out into the community doesn't always necessarily convert. 
as well we know knowledge doesn't always transfer to behavior, the fact that we, we know that this program works, how do we get it out there? And so placebo was usual care. And so when you think about, well, what's usual care? Do people really even know that they have prediabetes? And the answer is no. But if they had self-selected, so we knew that they were at risk. And so some of the other, uh, aside from that abnormal blood sugar between that range, the other was that you had gestational diabetes as a diagnosis during pregnancy because women are at a high risk for developing diabetes. Um, so placebo is they, you know, might have gone to the doctor and just gotten a handout that says, you know, eat healthier, but may not necessarily have been, uh, had a meeting with a registered dietitian or a health coach or any of those other uh, services that are available to us now. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. We really need a leader at the site because we need somebody who is dedicated and make sure that we have the conference room, that the calendar is made up, and somebody, the point person at the site itself does not have to be in the program, but we would like somebody to be committed, a point person uh, committed to the program. Instead of possibly you would have it during lunchtime or it would be right after work and it would be paid time. Offer, it could be right after work um, or during the lunch hour that it is, you're not taking from the employees um, um, their time off. And the group, we, 14 is minimum because we start with 14, you might end with 10 because people do um, drop out. It's a year-long program. Like CDC Diabetes Prevention Recognition Program. So it's really CDC DPRP. So, so it's a CDC uh, prevention program. And it, um, it, if you had us or that program come into your site, you're really assured that the National Diabetes Prevention program lifestyle intervention is delivered in an effective and a consistent way because everyone has had the same kind of training. Uh, organizations interested in offering the lifestyle classes can apply for recognition through CDC, I think. Is that right, Claire? And then they would go down for training in Atlanta. Um, once you are, CDC does provide some supportive tools, including performance analysis, training, and technical assistance. They've been you know, great to help. One, one. Okay. DP, uh, DPRP, for the recognition requirements application, um, you the, um, choose the cur curriculum. It's a one-year duration, so the whole program is one year. There are 16 one-hour um, course sessions following by, followed by monthly meetings. So it's, and it's one hour a week for 16 weeks. Usually goes to about 20, 20, yeah, 20 weeks because of holidays and things snow. like that coming, I mean, snow, things like that. Um, you need a minimum of nine co core sessions. So if somebody does participate, they have to go, I want to make sure I'm correct on this, they have to go at least nine of the 16 core sessions to be sort of part of the data. Uh, you document it over your body weight. 80% of the sessions you have to go in and get weighed. We weigh every single um, uh, session, same scale usually the same time of the day. Average weight loss of 5% from overall four sessions, not necessarily in a row, you would, the goal is that you would lose at least 5%. So it might really be towards the end, but it would be the four sessions. Average weight loss, I'm sorry, post-course sessions attendance, minimum of three, it's because you have about six post-course sessions, and those are just once a month. Um, documentation of body weight, 60% of the sessions attended. We have, um, Joan, we document everything, and then everything is sent in at the end of the year on what our rates have been. The weight loss achieved by the end of the total program, um, 5%. I'm not quite sure. That's of the post-core. Of the post-core, those six sessions that are once a month. And then the program eligibility, 50% must be documented with either blood. This is to get into the program. 50% of the have documented either with the um, gestational diabetes or with the, um, the blood, test, blood test. And then the other 50% could be CDC pre-diabetes screening, which we have a screening tool that you uh, check off 
criteria are basically 18 years of age or older and have a, boss mass, a body mass index, as I say, of um, over 24. And I gave that really minor one example, 5 foot 5, 144 pounds. That would be a body mass index of um, over 24. 50% of the program's documented blood-based diagnosis tests. So fasting blood uh, glu glucose would be between 100 and 125, because 126 is indicated of diabetes. Or you could have a um, glucose uh, load as a glucose tolerance test, or your A1C is between 5.7 and 6.5, 6.4, because when you get over there, then indeed you're, um, there's an indication of diabetes. Two tests. If you go in and just have one um, fasting blood glucose, and it might be high, that they really want you to go in for two. Um, or gestational diabetes, and then uh, again, maximum 50% based on the CDC pre-diabetes screening test. So the, there are other ones, I think, um, family members have a history of diabetes in the family. Can I just point out, um, I don't know if you noticed that it's a BMI for people that are of Asian descent, is oh, yes. at a lower, lower BMI. People that are Asian develop diabetes at a thinner weight. So it's really important to realize that that's different in populations. So I think we've gotten the message across that you could either find somebody who's recognized already or in the process of recognition, or you could create it yourself. And so some of the resources that you, you'll be able to find at the end of uh, the slides the, the program itself, what I thought was rather interesting, when, when it was in the research arena, it actually was that the um, lifestyle intervention was provided by a licensed practitioner, dietitian or a nurse. But as we realized that when we go into the community, there aren't enough of us in order to handle the workload, um, they, they really looked at using lifestyle coaches rather than a registered dietitian. I'm a lifestyle coach, Nan is a lifestyle coach, anybody can become a lifestyle coach as long as they're trained. And that's part of what the um, <coughs> group down in Atlanta can offer to you is the training around this specific project. Now I know that there are lifestyle coach pro programs out there that do a, you know, a plethitude of other trainings. Um, but just to be sure that you realize it isn't that it was only done by nurses and dietitians, that it was actually done by lifestyle coaches. And so when thinking about, you know, how do we get this into the community, that's a very expensive uh, program to offer to your clients, your patients, your employees, whatever. Um, and some of the expenses, as you can well imagine, are because of it being a nurse or a, uh, a dietitian. So by using lifestyle coaches, you can actually also save some uh, money because of that. So if you're interested, you can log on to this website and find the DTAC, which is the Diabetes Training uh, Services. Many people are asking the question, so why do I want to bother becoming recognized? I think the CDC is really asking for people to use something that's evidence-based. <coughs> We know that there are a lot of programs that are out there that are health and, ed, health and wellness programs um, that may not be evidence-based, and what we want to ensure is that this has been field-tested uh, and can certainly help to bring um, the kind of results that you're looking for. One of the other issues is, you know, right now, the diagnosis of diabetes, pre-diabetes, isn't a covered entity as anything in the field of insurance. And so by offering a program that's an uh, evidence-based program, CDC is hoping that reimbursement will improve. The two places that are reimbursing for it right now throughout the country, because this isn't just state in Massachusetts, throughout the country, um, you can get it through the YMCAs. Uh, YMCAs are covering it. The other is um, United Healthcare. So they're covering the total cost of the program, so it's this ELR program, 16 weeks plus each month uh, meeting every year, every month thereafter until they've completed the full year. So they are covering the costs of it. One thing to, um, <coughs> if I can just interject also, with the, the new uh, wellness 
credits mm -hmm. that will be coming out in the state of Massachusetts, employers will be able to apply. There's limited funds, but um, you'll be able to apply for up to 25% of the cost of wellness programs um, to a cap of $10,000. But um, the programs they, that we're still, and this is going to be something that we'll have at the wellness conference in May because the state is still putting together the criteria for what constitutes an eligible expense to submit to the state. Um, and it will definitely be one of these things where, you know, you'll, you'll want to be first in because there's a limited pot of money. Um, but um, it is talking about also having part of that cost to be the cost of employees on time off for wellness programs. So when you talk about, you know, giving, like making an offer during work time where, you know, people are on the clock, and they can go in that that becomes the cost of your wellness program that will be um, eligible for that reimbursement under the employer plan. So something to keep in mind mm -hmm. is that there will be money hopefully available. Mm -hmm. It is a preference for uh, employers of less than 100 employees for the program. So really trying to, I, not that it's not available to companies that are larger, but um, there is some additional preference, I think, for smaller companies to do this. The other one point is just that um, if, a rec if a program is recognized, it may be higher likelihood that a physician who's in charge of the patient's health care might refer more likely versus, you know, go to some weight loss clinic that's down the road that doesn't have the signs there. <laughs> so the question is, what's the return on investment? Um, the cost of diabetes care goes up if a person has poor blood sugar control and kidney damage. Kidney damage is indicated when there's protein in the urine and if there's an HbA1c over 7.9 percent. So the higher the A1c, the higher the risk. Um, certainly if you're older, this study actually came out of Calgary and so they looked at Ab Aborigine uh, native folks, so we can't really associate that with being our group, but I will say that the older the person, the more complicated they are. They've got multiple medical issues that are going on. Socioeconomic status and the length of time that they've had diabetes and whether or not they have other diseases such as hypertension. Um, the cost is estimated to be $27,000 to take care of a person over five years with diabetes. And uh, it goes up if we're older. One interesting point related to the diabetes prevention program, the folks that, you know, they looked at their age category, it was 18 years and older. The folks that were 65 and up did much, actually it was 61 <coughs> and up, actually did much better following this uh, diabetes prevention program than the younger folks. It's, it's possible that you could have them be enrolled in the program. Say, for instance, where we are right now, we actually do have somebody who doesn't have prediabetes. Um, but they're not, that data isn't going to be the data that gets sent to CDC. Okay. This study actually in 2010 that was in diabetes care said that it was very cost effective. So they had, you know, modest cost effective, no cost effective, not cost effective, modest cost effective versus very cost effective. And it's been assigned the category that it's very cost effective. So to reiterate, we want people that are a BMI of 24 or higher or 22 if you're in Asian descent or if you've been told by your doctor that you have um, at risk for type 2 diabetes because of this prediabetes blood sugar test, as well as gestational diabetes, and it's a 16-week core sessions along with post-core monthly follow-up for a total of a year. Now we do have them have to, they, they are required to do some homework. I mean, it's not just come and uh, listen to us talk. It's a very interactive uh, session. There's workbooks that are given to the uh, participants they get the class, they get, since it's 16 weeks, we don't give them the whole workbook. We give them the workbook each time they come. They get a new week. You know, if you give them, they never come back. Yeah. <laughs> don't want that to happen. And we do have them weigh in. So for those who can't get away from the office, there's actually a corporation or two that have now grown and developed their online programs. Um, and if you're interested about them, I can give you their names. I just learned of two of them this past week. So, um, you know, people can be at home. They get the video of the class. It's not live, but then they are uh, given a live coach that does coaching either over the phone or via the internet, mm -hmm. you know, using sort of the coaching <coughs> model that Blue Cross and Blue Shield or Tufts 
offers. Thank you so much.